Good morning. I hope that all of you are doing well. I pray that everyone is remaining healthy and uh, strong during this time of separation. I do pray that you are continuing to be careful even as our state and, and many other states are beginning to open up uh, some businesses and different things. Uh, I was thrilled to be able to get a haircut uh, but uh, but still, we need to be careful. Uh, looking at the numbers of this virus uh, just last night, the the numbers continue to increase. There are now something like uh, uh, 1,070,000 uh, cases in the United States alone, and uh, the death toll continues to rise. And so we need to be careful. We need to be vigilant. Uh, so uh, if you have masks, wear them. Uh, if you don't have to go out, don't. Uh, if you can stay home and protect yourself and your family and others that you may come in contact with, then that's what we should do. And so as a church, uh, we are doing well. Uh, when we uh, look at different uh, indicators of our, 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 our church life and health, uh, I think we're doing quite well. And so uh, we are going to continue to be conservative. Uh, we do desperately want to get back together. We certainly want to... Uh, uh, be able to greet you all and fellowship together, and I can't tell you how much I would love to be able to stand before you and preach rather than uh, preaching to my computer uh, here in my uh, bedroom, but uh, I want to be safe, and we don't want to uh, react out of fear, but at the same time, we want to uh, be wise, and so as long as we are doing well, uh, we're going to stay the course uh, for the time being. Um, now, you may be watching this before or after, but we are going to do a live streamed uh, communion today as well. And so I hope that you uh, will do that and join us and uh, just remember the sacrifice that our Lord uh, made for us. Well, today we are still in the book of Haggai. We are looking at Haggai's third message, which is in uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. And so we'll be looking at that. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn to the book of Haggai and, and to Haggai chapter 2, and uh, we'll read together verses 10 through 19 in just a moment. Now, uh, this next message that Haggai is given is uh, just a little bit uh, after uh, the first, and you'll see the date there when, when we read. It's the middle of December when he is giving this message. And so the people have been working now on the, uh, the temple for, I guess, a couple of months. And uh, there's probably some fatigue setting in, and they're thinking of some other things, as we'll explore in just a moment. But, uh, but uh, this is a great message for us, and, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope it encourages you uh, and uh, may even transform you a little bit. When discussing false teachings, Paul said in Galatians 5, verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. When we talk about leaven, we're talking about yeast. And yeast is a, a single-cell fungus that eats sugar. And as it eats, it produces ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide gas. And so when yeast is introduced to bread dough, the released gas is trapped in the dough the elastic dough, and it causes the dough to rise and to expand. Now, it does that because the yeast doesn't remain isolated in one spot. It moves and multiplies and spreads throughout the whole lump of dough. Now, because of this invasive nature, leaven or yeast is often used in Scripture as a metaphor for sin. And the lesson behind the metaphor is that sin, any little sin, invades the whole person. Once it's introduced, it can't be removed. A person can't have a sinful hand or a sinful eye. No, the whole person has been invaded by sin. The whole person, therefore, is a sinner. Now, Haggai uses a similar illustration to make his point with the returned exiles. And then he applies uh, the truth from that illustration to his hearers. He diagnoses the problem. He issues a prognosis of what will happen if they don't change. 
and then he prescribes a solution to their problem so that they may experience healing. I mean, it sounds like a preacher, doesn't he? So let's read together Haggai's third message from Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. And again, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. On December 18th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. Ask the priests this question about the law. If one of you is carrying some meat from a holy sacrifice in his robes, and his robe happens to brush against some bread or stew, wine or olive oil, or any other kind of food, will it also become holy? And the priest replied, No. Then Haggai asked, If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food then be defiled? And the priest answered, Yes. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with these people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offered is defiled by their sin. Look at what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refused to return to me, says the Lord. Think about this 18th day of December the day when the rebuilding of the Lord's temple began. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now. While the seed is still in the barn, you have not yet harvested your grain, and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day onward, I will bless you. Let's pray to the Lord for the understanding of his message. Heavenly Father God, we ask you to speak to us through this prophet Haggai. From thousands of years ago, Lord, these words are still relevant with us today. And Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would invade our lives, and that you would transform us from the inside out. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit as I bring this message, this lesson today. And I pray that you would speak through me, that it would be your message. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Overflow me with your righteousness that I might be a worthy mouthpiece for you. We love you and thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have this illustration that Haggai uses with the people, and we find it here in verses 12 and 13. It seems that Haggai the prophet is directed by the Lord to present two scenarios to the priests that deal with things that are clean and unclean. The first involves consecrated meat from a temple sacrifice. If, if you recall, some of the sacrifices that we read about in Leviticus, uh, some of the meat is set aside for the priests and Levites' use. That's that's part of how they are repaid for their service. And so that meat is holy, it is consecrated, it's special, and only the priests and the Levites are to eat that meat. Well, <clears throat> the Jews of Haggai's day would, would keep that consecrated meat apart uh, from other food for purity reasons. It was holy, and it, and it just couldn't be put along side of, of, of other food, of what would be considered unconsecrated, maybe unholy food. So in Haggai's illustration, uh, the consecrated meat is evidently carried in their robes. You know, they wore long robes, and so to carry things, they would, they would uh, kind of take a corner of that robe to make like a, a bag. Sometimes, uh, like, you'll see kids pull out their shirt and put stuff in it and hold it up, but uh, they would put the meat uh, there in the fold of their garment. And so then Haggai asks, what if later on that part of the garment that carried the holy meat were to touch some other kind of food. Does that then mean that that bread or stew or wine or whatever that garment once carry that garment touched that carried the sacred meat is that food now sacred? Is it consecrated? And of course the priests answered no because there's there's nothing in that about the law. 
So what they're saying is that this good food, this, this uh, consecrated meat doesn't extend itself to other foods, so it doesn't make those foods holy or consecrated. Then Haggai moves on to his second scenario. Jewish law prescribed that someone who had been in contact with a dead body was ritually unclean, and then anything that that person touched also became unclean. We see that in Leviticus 22 and Numbers 19. So Haggai asks, if that person who touched a dead person then touches bread or stew, does that food become defiled? And the priest rightly answered, yes, in verse 13. The bad of the defilement from the dead body does extend itself into everything else that that person touched. Haggai's point is this. Good things do not automatically make other things good, but bad things do make other things bad. Because one thing is pure, it doesn't necessarily make other things pure. But when one thing is impure, it does make other things impure. Let me give you a modern way to look at it. Uh, you come home from the grocery store with a new carton of good, fresh milk. But when you open the refrigerator, you see that there's still some milk left in an old carton. But it's a week out of date, and you know you can already smell it. It's, it's gone bad. It's turned sour. But you, 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 you're frugal, and so you hate to waste that old milk. So you decide to mix the two cartons together. So the question is, does the new good milk make the old bad milk good again? I don't think so. Or does the old bad milk then invade the new good milk and make that good milk bad? Of course it does. And so the general principle of this whole message is this. Good things are no remedy for bad things. Haggai's application of this illustration to the, to the people comes in verse 14, where he responds, That is how it is with, these, with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. It's not that the people had never done anything good. After all, they left their homes and jobs and families, in some cases, behind in, in Babylon. And, and they made plans to build the temple. They'd even worked so far as to lay its foundation. And they were bringing sacrifices uh, to the altar to, that they had set up, sacrifices for God. But no matter how worthy these things were, they never canceled out the bad, postponing the work on the temple prioritizing their own comforts first, putting their needs above God's needs, procrastinating on God's work. You see, good works offer no remedy for our sin. Haggai calls on the people to recognize just how bad life was when they neglected God. This is the diagnosis. Look at verses 15 and 16. It says, Look what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for a 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. And when you expected to draw 50 gallons from your wine press, you found only 20. Through God, I'm mean, sorry, through Haggai, God made it clear that this was not an accidental succession of bad harvests. It wasn't merely coincidental misfortune. God said in verse 17, I sent the blight and the mildew and the hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. God was disciplining his people for their misplaced priorities. And from that experience, they should have realized how much they had failed to honor God, and from there tried to put things right. But they hadn't. Even so you refuse to return to me, says the Lord in verse 17. Now, this is not something new that the Israelites had never heard before. Uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. 
The same point holds true for Christians today. The writer of Hebrews quoted the same Proverbs in Hebrews chapter 12. But then he encouraged us by saying a little later on in, in Hebrews 12, 10, God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. And this is exactly what God was doing with his children in Haggai's day. You see, God wants his children to have the best life that we can have. But he knows that we were designed to be at our best when he is at the center of our lives. When we move away from that and allow something else to take his place at the center, then he has to remind us how bad things can get when we aren't centered on him. And so then Haggai gives a prognosis. A prognosis involves forecasting the likely outcome of a disease and especially the chances of recovery. So what's the prognosis of these people in Haggai's day? Well, God sends a strong message that nothing is going to get better unless there is real change. Verses 18 and 19. Think about this 18th day of December, the day when the rebuilding of the Lord's temple began. Think carefully. God says, think carefully, or your version may say, give careful thought. Don't you see God's discipline, Haggai is saying to the people, don't you realize that if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. These are the early days after they began this new phase of building, but they're still hungry and there's still a long way to go. So what's the warning? Well, the warning is that there will be a better future only if you truly repent and put God above all else in your lives. So Haggai gives a prescription, and the prescription is simple. God says, verse 17, return to me. Uh, again, this phrase is not unique to Haggai. It's repeated by the Lord through his prophets over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. God begs his chosen people throughout hundreds and hundreds of years. Remember the covenant. Return to me. Then I will bless you. So often I think we think that the Old Testament paints this picture of God as being a jealous, wrathful, and uncompromising being. And in part, uh, this is true because these are indeed true attributes of God. This is the God that, that many people reject because they don't believe that they can ever measure up. And they're right. But just as people have many sides to their emotions and personalities, God is also multifaceted. Yes, God is a God of absolute justice, righteousness and unchanging perfection and he is wrathful against impurity but he is also a god of love mercy and grace and we don't have to measure up to the strict laws of holiness because god out of love made a way for us to be measured not by our own righteousness but by his righteousness that was sacrificed on the cross. Why did God choose Israel as his special people through whom he would ultimately bless all nations? I mean, he could have chosen any nation. The powerful Hittites, the unstoppable Babylonians, the ever-present Egyptians, the enlightened Greeks, even the Romans. But he didn't. He chose the backwater, stiff-necked, unfaithful Israelites because he loved them for no more reason than he sovereignly chose to, according to his own good pleasure. You see, Judah didn't have a business contract with God, but a covenant, 
a spiritual agreement. And they had broken that covenant, and they had suffered because of it. But God had not given up on his people. Even after they failed again and again, God still loved his people. And the prescription for a new relationship with him was simple. Return to me. In Israel, the rains come in late December and into January. So the planning needs to be done just before that in early to middle December. And this message from Haggai was delivered on December 18th. Everyone working on rebuilding the temple would now be thinking about the necessity of getting the planting done so that there would be food come spring. I'm sure that God knew that they were getting ready to walk away once again from his work to do their own work. And so he sent Haggai with this message. Look at verse 19. I am giving you a promise. Now, while the seed is still in the barn, you have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day onward, I will bless you. You know, God doesn't expect his children to do church work all day, every day, to the exclusion of everything else. God knew that the seed needed to be planted. He knew that the grapevines needed to be trimmed and readied. He knew that they had to work in order to survive. Even the Apostle Paul had to take a break from his missionary work every once in a while to make tents and earn a living so that he could then go back and continue with God's work of being a missionary. What God doesn't want them to do is to slip back into the habit of not keeping God first in their lives. Think about this. All these people had ever known was God's judgment and discipline. They'd been exiled to a foreign hostile land. They had then responded to the call to return, but nothing has prospered in the 15 years since they've been back. But now God promises healing there in verse 17, return to me. And verse 19, from this day onward, I will bless you. Their harvest will profit. profit prosper. There'll be enough food to eat. The temple will be rebuilt, and once again, they will know joy and blessing in their relationship with God. God spoke special words to Solomon when he finished building the first temple, and, and they would be just as appropriate for Haggai's people. That was in 2 Chronicles seven 14. I'm sure you've heard this. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Our loving God never holds back. He doesn't appoint people on a trial basis and then cast them aside when they fail. When they return to him, he embraces them, he forgives their sins, and he fills their lives with good things. God is good and pours that goodness out on his people. I will bless you, he tells Haggai's people, and he meant it. I've heard people uh, say things like this or even tell me everything is okay in moderation. Is it really? Well, what about sin? Fresh milk doesn't improve sour milk because what's sour will spoil the fresh. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Regardless of what they say uh, they believe, most people tend to think of God's judgment in terms of those old-fashioned plate scales. The good goes on one side and the bad goes on the other. And as long as the good outweighs the bad, well, then they believe that God will accept them into heaven. 
The problem is that people make their own judgments about what belongs on one side and what belongs on the other side. And there's no hard and fast rules or guidelines about what's good and what's bad. Nor is there any way to know how much good is enough. The message here is that God does not judge that way. Good things don't cancel out bad things. God seeks a life which is pure, through and through, and that will never be achieved by hoping that the good in our lives will outweigh the bad. It only comes through God's healing, ultimately and only through the gift of new life from Jesus Christ. He comes to his people with healing, help, wholeness, and by his Spirit gives power to live a completely new life. Now, we will still make mistakes, but a person with God at the center recognizes when their life has gone wrong, and they seek forgiveness, and they readjust back to God's will. This is a good life. It's a rich life. It's a life with promise. It is a life under God's blessings. As Haggai's people had to learn, good actions don't compensate for bad actions. Thankfully, a merciful and gracious God doesn't require us to earn our salvation by being good. He gifts new life to those who return to him, who call out to him and ask him to save them when they let him be front and center in their whole lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message, and I thank you for the love that you have shown to us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us, to bless Frederica Baptist Church. Lord, as we continue to go through this time of pandemic, as we continue to uh, try and be safe and protect each other from this uh, virus that is going around. Lord, I pray that even in this time of isolation, Lord, that we would constantly look to you, that we would attempt to constantly readjust our lives so that you are front and center in them. Lord, we want to do your work. We want to be there uh, doing your will. We want to be in the center of your will. And I pray that you would be with us and help us in doing that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, if, if you've been listening to these messages online, and, and I hope you have, and I hope you've enjoyed them and, and that you've gotten some hope from them, uh, but you are feeling like there's something more. You're feeling like there's something I'm missing. Well, what you're missing may be a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and as Lord of your salvation. If you would like to talk to somebody, like to talk to me about that, then please call the number that you see at the close of this message and you'll be directed to someone who can talk to you about our loving Savior, Jesus. I hope you have a great day and a wonderful week. And thank you for joining us.